I want to first thank everyone for coming today. Uh, I know it's a little early. Um, I'm Teddy Downey. I'm the executive editor at the Capitol Forum. And uh, first, I just wanted to note we had a really interesting conference yesterday as well uh, with uh, Elizabeth Warren giving a keynote speech on antitrust. I encourage you all to check that out. It's uh, hosted at New America's website. And we should have a, a link to it on our site as well. Um, and today's conversation is uh, the second day of our conference. And we're interested in getting the views of conservative thought leaders and industry stakeholders. Um, and I also wanted to quickly note that we, as a firm, uh, the Capital Forum has recently launched a, 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 a product that specifically focuses on monopolization and abuse of dominance in uh, and, and antitrust and competition issues specifically in uh, the tech sector. So, uh, you know, the EU case uh, against Google, any monopolization enforcement in the U.S., we're going to be covering that going forward. So I just wanted to quickly note that. Um, and we're honored to have some great speakers here on, the, on our first panel, which is, uh, again, you know, conservative and free, and free market perspectives on uh, digital platforms and competition. And we have Chip Pickering. Uh, Congressman Chip Pickering became CEO of uh, Encompass in January 2014. Congressman Pickering was a six-term congressman representing Mississippi's third district. And during his time, he served on the House and Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, he also was co-chairman and founder of the Congressional Wireless Caucus and an assistant minority whip in the House. Uh, we also have Alden Abbott. Alden Abbott became Rumpel's Senior Legal Fellow and Deputy Director of the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation in April 2014. He previously served as Director of Patent and Antitrust Strategy for BlackBerry. He also worked as Director of Antitrust Policy for the FTC. He was Acting General Counsel of the Commerce Committee, Chief Counsel for the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, and Senior Counsel of the Justice Department. So a really incredible, rich uh, experience uh, for Alden. And we also have Dennis Shaw. He's the CEO for the Community Financial Services Association of America. Mr. Shaw previously served as Senior Advisor to Representative Barney Frank on the House Financial Services Committee, where he worked on Dodd-Frank. Um, and I, I, I think the real opportunity here is to get a diverse uh, set of views on what it means to be, have a conservative or free market perspective on competition policy. And I'd love to, you know, you know ask you all what, what that means to you, you know, a, conser a, con a conservative or free market perspective on, on competition. And we'll start with Congressman Pickering. Uh, Teddy, uh, thank you uh, very much. As we talk about uh, free markets, competition, digital platforms, and from a conservative perspective, uh, I'm trying to think through how do you structure that conversation, how do you define it, how do you give both historical context and then make it relevant for the, for the decisions and the issues uh, that, that our Congress and our agencies, whether it is FTC, FCC, or the Justice Department, how do they actually promote competition in today's world? And what does it mean? What are the guiding principles and, and the objectives? And so as we go through a conservative perspective, uh, let me first uh, try to define that there are two forms of conservatism. There is freedom conservatives, and I would define that as, as those who, who really have a universal view, view of, of human freedom, free markets, free enterprise, and the importance of maximizing individual freedom. So that's one form of conservatism, and, and probably the best historical figure that represents that is Ronald Reagan. And then you have protectionist conservatism. And so you want to protect the status quo, the existing business models, possibly the, the existing culture. You're, you're trying to protect what, what you know, not what is changed or disruptive, or what, what a lot of times comes with free markets, disruption, innovation, complete change of the economy as we know it. And so there's protectionist conservatism and there's freedom conservatism, and they're, they are very different. Today's uh, Republican nominee, Donald Trump, embodies protectionist conservatism. So 
two forms of conservatism. I am a freedom conservative. And as we look at competition policy, since I arrived in Washington in 1989 working for the first Bush administration, at the end of the Cold War as, the, as communism collapsed and we were trying to promote free markets and free trade into Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union and build democratic institutions. And at the same time, our country was going through this transformational period of monopoly uh, policy across most of our economic uh, sectors into competition and competitive markets, free markets. And what, do, uh, what is the history of competition policy and what do we define as competition policy? So let me go through four seminal moments of, that define competition policy, give you kind of the structure of what competition policy is, and then how it relates to where we are uh, today. So 1984, the Justice Department under uh, President Reagan breaks up AT&T. Uh, most people don't uh, think of it this way, that, but that was probably the most significant domestic decision that the Reagan administration did with the greatest lasting economic consequence and the most transformational uh, benefit to the American economy of anything that he did. And why do I say that? Most people don't think of it uh, that way. But when you ended uh, monopoly policy in long distance, you had one network for 50 years starting in 1934, one technology, copper, TDM, analog, <coughs> one service, phone, one device that you could rent from the phone company. And that was for 30 years with no real innovation, no real change. And you break up AT&T and within five years, five years, you have MCI, you have Sprint, you have WorldCom, you have WillTel, you have UUNet. All of a sudden, everyone is building fiber, digital, long distance, global networks, which become what? The internet backbone. So it's the first element of the information age in the internet revolution. And that competition policy quickly drove down prices, better services, and a, and a period of abundance of capacity. Now remember, monopoly is scarcity, competition is abundance. And there's two different worldviews that come. A protectionist thinks that it's a zero-sum game that you have to have a gatekeeper that monitors and manages and keeps people out or disconnects or is isolated and is local. An abundant free market competitive view is let's open the gates, let's connect our networks, let's have everything interoperable and everything competitive, and we'll have growth, innovation, investment, abundance. Second big thing that happened was 1992, the Cable Act. There was a cable monopoly, local monopoly, and Congress passed an act that said we're going to bring uh, competition to cable and it's going to come through satellite. What was the, the, the rule that they required is that content, video content, would be equally available to satellite companies as it is to the cable company. We went from analog cable to digital satellite, 300 channels, abundance of channels of satellite, 30 channels of cable. Cable in competitive response, built a new fiber network, the cable modem, went from analog to digital, and now we have a digital platform in the local and in the long distance. And it was the second part of the transformation of our economy of, a, of an internet age. Third big thing. 1993, we say, instead of having a duopoly and wireless, which was our policy up until that point, we are now going to have competitive auctions where we will have in every market up to seven competitors. We had auctions, we began deploying and building, and in 20 years we have had four generations of technologies, and we went from analog and wireless to digital and wireless, and it gave the network capability that enabled the smartphone and everything that has then come into the, to this generation's world because of a competitive decision in wireless. And the, fifth, uh, the fourth big thing was in 1996, uh, the Congress passed on a bipartisan basis, Republican Congress with a, a Democrat president, Bill Clinton, the, the policy that ended all monopolies across all sectors, 
connected all networks together with the policy of interconnection and competition, removed all barriers, and that ended monopoly policy in our digital technology telecom world for good. We celebrated the 20th anniversary of that this year. That is the, the essence of competition policy, and it transformed our economy and created more wealth, more abundance, more innovation, more uh, investment than any set of acts that we've done over the last 30 years. In the context today of what is relevant, the open internet, the interconnection policy of that, uh, devices being interoperable, which is a core component of the internet competition policy. You have the set-top box issue, which is now before the FCC. Last mile, breaking all gatekeepers that block competition. You have the business data services. And in the incentive auction, you're continuing to have a competitive structure in wireless, both licensed and unlicensed. So those are the issues that define competition policy and difference between freedom conservatives and protectionist conservatives. The incumbent business model or the incumbent network is wanting to, to limit access, be the gatekeeper, control uh, access to content, limit the interoperability of devices so that they can control the market. The internet companies are the ones that are wanting openness, interconnection, and access to any device. There are two different worldviews, and there are two very different outcomes that come as a result. Very, very interesting conversation. I'd like to ask uh, Alden the same, same question. I'm guessing he has a slightly different perspective. So uh, Alden, um, you know, what is conservative or free market perspective on comp competition policy uh, in, in, in these markets mean to you? Oh, well, well, thanks, Teddy. I mean, I think I agree with everything uh, Congressman said. Um, but I guess I just add, I sort of come to look at competition from a law and economics perspective. I had a concern about competition and antitrust is what economists call consumer welfare. That is that you want to have policies that maximize a welfare to broadly understood to consumers and, and also producers as, as, as well. Now, the problem with regulation, as the Congressman pointed out, that once it becomes old and static, uh, even something that was called a natural monopoly, and for decades it was believed that telephone network was a natural monopoly, it precludes innovation. What's characteristic, and we're going to talk a little bit about digital platforms, about these new digital platforms, is they haven't been regulated. And indeed, to its credit, the Clinton administration, and followed up by the Bush 43 administration, took a policy of not regulating uh, uh, internet uh, provision. There was still residual regulation of various sorts, local and, and federal, on former monopoly um, networks that became lighter and lighter. But generally, the idea was let, let uh, the internet be free. And that has. Uh, in the last 10, 15 years led to the profusion of these new so-called uh, digital platforms that bring together two or more groups of buyers and sellers. For example, uh, obviously Google, but Apple in its own way is uh, Yahoo, all the internet service. Uh, but Apple, for example, uh, with its iOS operating system and components as, such as app stores and iTunes, bring together users, software developers, and hardware suppliers. And although these companies have, Google certainly has a great market share, uh, in general they have not been regulated. And that, that's been a very good thing. Now, concerns sometimes are raised about, well, these are monopolies. Uh, look at, at the huge market share in search that Google has. And I just remind people of the t uh, a decade ago when people said that Yahoo would become a permanent monopoly search engine, and then they said MySpace would become the permanent monopolist in social networks. When you have co competition is allowed to thrive, uh, and there are no na barriers to entry, unlike the regulatory or capital expenditure barriers to ent entry that existed under the old telecom monopoly, you, you can get great innovation. And indeed, the, the uh, internet has enabled digital, lower cost digital transmission 
which has enabled the Googles of this world to put together advertisers and eyeballs. Now, traditional antitrust, which is concerned about the ability of a monopolist, a uh, big firm maybe to reduce output and raise price, the traditional rules don't apply here. A, there is uh, competition, as they say, is only a click or two away, but uh, more significantly, the, the whole system is different because you're putting together different groups. You are not just selling one product to a group of, of customers and want a higher price. You don't pay directly to get onto Google. Why? Because if you had to pay too much, you would have a reduction in number of users, reduction in the advertiser's interest. Google would lose money and you would lose benefits. But that similarly argues to the fact that antitrust enforcers uh, have to, should be very, very careful. Uh, there's a very good uh, economist, jo uh, Joshua Wright, used to be Federal Trade Commissioner, who has a very good article on, on digital platforms uh, last year in the George Washington Law Review. And uh, I think he, he and others point out that we don't, the economists have studied di di digital networks, say you don't want the usual antitrust rules about worrying about uh, that apply to in the normal sectors precisely because of these differences in digital networks. However, there is a problem. Uh, digital uh, platforms, be precisely because they are very large and attract a lot of press interest and public interest normally will attract regulators just as uh, flies are, are attracted to sugar or honey. And that's a reality. I have well, spent many years in government. Government officials are hardworking, well-meaning, but uh, they tend to see monopoly, uh, certainly in the antitrust side, monopoly or competitive problems uh, whenever you have a large institution. So if they don't understand how a search engine is working, they may, they may say, well, what's your algorithm? You're favoring certain advertising sites uh, affiliated with you and maybe Yahoo or somebody else isn't able to get the same deal with those sites. Well, that's called competition. As long as government isn't stepping in to favor Google or to favor its contracts, uh, you, you should not be worried about that. Now, the, to its credit, the FTC's uh, initial antitrust investigation of Google closed a few years ago, and it was a small scale consent decree, but they didn't fiddle with the algorithm. Unfortunately, that's not the same thing with the European Commission. European Commission currently has three ongoing significant antitrust investigations of Google. And uh, some, at least one or two of them are largely centered on the algorithm. Now, the irony here is the Europeans are saying they want to be a digital leader. They want their platforms to be uh, the best and uh, they want to be a leader, but the reason they're not a leader is because they have a much more governance-centric regulatory view of the world. It, it's no coincidence that uh, the U.S. has produced most of the leading <coughs> digital platforms. Some have started in Europe now. Analogs of, of Uber, for example, are appearing in France. I was uh, uh, at a conference recently talking. and but. Whenever, uh, as I say, regulators see these new platforms, they're suspicious that, well, they're not subject to existing regulatory rules or they're getting too large, we need to do something. And regrettably, that it's a problem because uh, as 80% of the world, I'd say more or less, is more attuned to the European view of antitrust. There's another concern, so consumer protection, so-called big data. There's a lot of concern that, well, these, the Googles of this world are accumulating large collections of data. Somehow that might make them a monopolist. Well, again, data is not a natural barrier to entry. It can be acquired by a lot of firms. But if the companies engage in false, uh, you know, in data, uh, bad la data security, or in uh, false statements regarding the degree of protection they're providing or their privacy policy, they can be gone after. As the Federal Trade Commission has gone after Google and other companies, I think some of those uh, cases were not necessarily uh, well designed. For example, there was one feature where uh, a sales app remained open, an Apple uh, sales app for 15 minutes, 
So after you signed in, gave your password, uh, you wouldn't have to re-enter your password to make additional sales. Well, uh, the concern was some children were, uh, when mommy and daddy were turned away, were uh, buying goods that was harming those families. FTC went after that. Again, the question there, however, is that many other people benefited from that app. And should, should the FTC have gone after it? But on the whole, serious deception, serious fraud, we and certainly the Europeans have plenty of tools to go after that. You don't need to have ex ante or regulation in advance to, to handle that. So I guess the short, the short thing is that uh, uh, the U.S. did not become leader of the Internet economy by accident. It was a bipartisan understanding forged at the same time as the 1996 uh, Telecom Act as the Internet began to develop that the Internet should be free from heavy-handed regulation. Unfortunately, and we see things at the Federal Communications Commission now with regard to Internet service providers, the philosophy may be changing. I don't think that's in the long-term interest of our economy or free markets. Uh, if you want the goose that lays the innovative golden eggs to continue to produce, uh, you might consider uh, not uh, tying it down. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's also very interesting. And Dennis, you have a, a really interesting story to tell about your industry and, and, and what's happened with Google. If you wouldn't mind um, telling that story, and also I'd be interested in what, what you think uh, a conservative response to that type of behavior might be, or you know, a, a, you know, conservative or free market policy response. Well, thank you, Teddy. <clears throat> I'm very glad to be on this panel and very glad to have this audience, even if early in the morning. Um, I, I might begin by saying I've cleared a very high hurdle here. It's not uh, often that someone who's had a continuing association with Barney Frank gets to sit on conservative panels. <laughs> uh, and, and there was some scrutiny of that, I'm sure. Uh, the truth is that, uh, and, and I will get fairly immediately to your questions, Teddy, the truth is that I am guilty of ideological drift, and it represents, I think, the initial divide in my family, where my father's family was ardently Republican. I remember my grandfather would not vote for Eisenhower because uh, he thought that Eisenhower had ridiculed Taft, and uh, it, it was that sort of, of uh, classic conservative, and on my mother's side, it was exactly the opposite. I uh, uh, met Barney during the civil rights struggle, and I want to make this single point the constant in my life uh, is that I have been, and I'm not sure I was conscious of it all the time, but I have been very concerned about the question of due process in the first 10 amendments all my life. When you think about the issues that motivated me to activism, uh, the first was civil rights, the second was the protest against the war in Vietnam. I, of course, was very uh, interested in what happened in the Balkans and spent some time on housing in the Balkans. All those questions were centered in the individual and his relationship to government. The tragedy for those of us who started off as Democrats is that now Democrats, at best, have a passing flirtation with the capitalist system. And frankly, the, uh, the hallmark or the change began, I think, with the McGovern campaign and a rather persistent drift to the left. If you were to look to at today's politics, it is hard to find anyone running for office among the three major candidates left, uh, if you consider, consider Bernie Sanders to be one, anyone who is avowedly defending the free enterprise system. And uh, frankly, I think that ignores history in the sense that the free market system really is tied hand in glove to issues like the first 10 amendments and to uh, our freedom directly in part because it repudiates what we now see so much of, identity politics, which basically makes a silhouette of a person and casts that person as part of a group without singularly touching the individual's worth as an individual. It's extremely dangerous. We, uh, we have interfaced with Google in a, in a, a, very, in a very strange way. Uh, we are fighting uh, a battle uh, largely against the bureaucracy and the federal government to sustain ourselves as an industry, in part because part of our members are payday members, and payday members have become a, a, anathema both to parts of the left and to parts of this government. We woke up at 
at uh, a period about three or four weeks ago in which Google announced that they would no longer carry any advertisements. And what was peculiar, for, for payday lenders particularly, what was peculiar about that in terms of coincidence was it came just before the uh, government would announce its rules on payday lending. And if you, if you are interested and care to find out, you can see that the most frequent visitor to the White House among entities is indeed Google. So is there a tie-in between these two facts? I have no idea. But what, it, what was impressive to us is that Google must, in my judgment, re-identify itself internally. That is to say, what standard allows it to say to a regulated industry that you're not an, any longer allowed to be a part of our advertising? And frankly, when I looked at the, the statements that came out, they do not bear scrutiny. Uh, one of them was, we were advised by other entities that payday lending fell into the category of pornography and guns. Really? In what sense are they identical? That happens to be, by the way, the same categorization that we sued the FDIC and OCC on because they had a list of industries that they went to banks and said, if you have clients who have bank accounts, not lines of credit, not borrowings, but bank accounts from these entities, you ought to get rid of them. We're in the midst of what's called uh, our litigation on what is called Operation Choke Point, and it bears some similarity to what we're expressing with regard to the Google thing. Not, not only does that question arise as to how they began to get in their sites our industry, but what also struck me was the, in, the, uh, the lack of any coherent reason how they got there in terms of their suspending our advertising. Meaning that if it is groups coming to you as Google and saying, you ought to know this about that, let's wait for the day in which the sugar, uh, the anti-sugar people come and say, why don't you get rid of Coke? for heaven's sakes, as an advertiser here. There's an awful lot of sugar in that stuff, and we can show you studies that don't, uh, that say that it's very bad for your health. Now, of course, we had no opportunity to say anything to Google about their decision. And beyond that, they, uh, they made their decision in the absence of any data. What I am discovering, to my great chagrin, is that there is a sort of gateway that if you're on the left wing, you can get very closely through. If I announce that I am a public interest group and I say that I have credentials that are basically left-wing groups, that is usually all you need to say to certain entities, and Google appears to be one of those. So I am concerned about uh, something beyond the Google case that certainly relates to Google, and it is simply this. The, the rise of entities that create perplexing problems for government really should cause us to rethink how much we should do ourselves as individuals and private entities to make certain that we don't run into situations that lead many other people to say it's time for government regulation. I certainly agree with the idea that we're best off with the freedom that is enhanced by having private entities be totally free. There is no question about that. But the responsibility that then accrues to the private entity is to conduct itself in such a way that it really manifests the best aspects of capitalism. And one of those is certainly the competing sense of values and the judgments that entities should make based on some form of evidence. That was not apparent to us at all in the Google case. Just a footnote to, to uh, uh, when I spoke about my own ideological drift, one constant in what has happened over the last 30 years is the rise of what I what loosely can be called the bureaucratic state. Our anger as citizens at government is far less at those who are in Congress and in the Senate, though we don't often, I think the citizenry can't make these distinctions very readily, but it is much more at the entities that affect daily life, whether you're talking about the IRS, whether you're talking about the EPA, whether you're talking about now the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in our case, it is the nameless and faceless bureaucrats that are really the targets of so much anger, but there's no way to manifest that. Consider just, for example, the entity that we face, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. It has now uh, 
well over a thousand employees. It has a great name. One of the things that happens with bureaucracies is the naming means so much. The Environmental Protection Agency was clean air and clean water at inception. It was not snail darters and, uh, and the question of where marshlands begin. People have a hard time envisioning the path of bureaucracies, and Congress has as much trouble with that as anybody De else does. Dennis, I want to I want to I want to interject here really quickly. I want to move uh, to open up to questions, but I, it, you really seem to be tying yourself in knots to leave Google alone, despite Google exerting power over your market in a way that just unilaterally cuts you off from advertising. If you didn't care about Google, and if it were an open market and you could just advertise through someone else, you wouldn't be complaining about it. So, I mean, you're, I, you're, you're, you're sort of advocating for a, you're just going to ask them to reconsider. Is that, is that effectively the strategy? Let me tell you that uh, I don't think it's telling myself in that. What is, the, what is the opening principle? The opening principle is that it is a false response for an entity that finds itself in the grips of a private entity to run immediately to government. That implies everything that I don't believe is good about uh, in my own ideology. In other words, if, if I believe that there is too much bureaucratization and too much, uh, too much growth in government, then my solution to a problem inflicted on me personally or institutionally is not to say the government should handle it. The question that pervades the society that we don't seem to be willing to face is, government is a fairly pure representation of where the citizens are. And whether you talk about consumer protection or about Google, the question ultimately comes back, are we looking at a generation that will not take responsibility for its own actions? I implore Google to, to look internally about the question of where it is going with its form of censorship, because inevitably, if they stay on it, they will face government regulation. But, but that's it, not something it, that I want in, to see In happen. the end, though, you're, you're basically just going to ask them to reconsider censoring you, as opposed to... As, as asking opposed, for government yes, to respond. Yes, I, 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 this I, is I, interesting because they're 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 not gonna they're not gonna change their mind. But your solution implies a steady. I, no, I, I don't have a solution. I just I'm just. Well, just when a, you when you posit the question as saying you can't either allow Google to change its mind by petition of some sort, or you can ask for government release, I believe yeah. that is a false set of alternatives. And were I to have to choose, I would choose the former over the latter because the growth of bureaucracy is self-accelerating once the established bureaucracy comes into being. So I think we all have to take a longer view. I'm not for the growth of some form of government intervention with Google. Therefore, even though I hurt from what they do, I cannot against, go against my principal belief, which is there is already too much government intervention. Let's open things up to questions. I mean, this is a really, I, I have a lot of questions here. I, I, I want to follow up. I want to open it up to the audience. Do we have any questions out there? We've got a few minutes for, for questions. I have one more. Um, Alden, you said that the EU is overextending yourself, and I, I'd like to get Chip's thought on this as well, but overextending, is, you know, it's, you know uh, coming after Google, uh, three pending cases in antitrust, one on search, one on advertising. Uh, one on Android, these aren't enduring monopolies, they'll go away quickly. What happens if the EU goes after Google and all of a sudden a lot of tech companies want to go work in the EU and create vertical searches that, you know, they have more protection to compete with Google and, and you saw, you know, you saw more tech growth in Europe as a result. Would you, would you change your mind about the U.S. approach being the right one, or would, you, uh, would, would that be a natural enough of an experiment for you? Well, I would be very surprised to see more innovation come about from what Europeans are doing. I mean, I've worked, talked, dealt with the European Commission. For the last 15 years, Europeans have every year said that they're going to be more innovative, they're going to be the fount of, of innovation on uh, that uh, the rules uh, for the, single, for the uh, single market are just going to expand their uh, innovative abilities. And yet all of the great search, almost all of the great significant uh, search engines uh, 
and other digital platforms have developed in the United States. Now, if uh, the, the problem is precisely because they're regu regulating, a successful U.S. company may be face its greatest opposition from its competitors who complain to the European Commission about what's happening. You're, you know, would, would I change my mind? All I can say is there's been a natural experiment going on <coughs> for the last 25 years, and, and in so many dimensions, Europe has slipped well, has had slower innovation and slow economic growth in the U.S. I think that in it speaks volumes. What might happen in the future, I don't know, but I'd, I'd be very, very surprised to see more innovation come about because of in European investigations of Google. And, and Chip, I'd like your thoughts on not only that question, but also, you know, in your opinion, who are there dominant players in, in, in the tech, telecom, and media worlds? And, 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 you know, I know you've brought up some, some, some ideas, but I'd be interested in what your uh, ideas are on addressing those, uh, those dominant firms. Well, uh, this is where Alden and I may disagree. So he takes an antitrust view that when there is a market failure, only when there's a market failure should you intervene. And I, I view competition policy much like a doctor views a patient. If you have preventive care, can you avoid catast catastrophic care? And what is an example of that? So when, when we had a, a policy developed in the financial services with a multiple and bipartisan series of decisions, you had a catastrophic failure of financial services in 2008. And it was around a, a policy called too big to fail. And because of that, as a conservative, we have seen the highest level of spending, the greatest accumulation of debt, the greatest amount of regulation to then try to remedy the failure. From my perspective, it would be much better to maintain competition policy in the beginning and at the front to prevent a failure than only to treat a failure because the cost at that time is so much greater. And how do you do in, in digital platforms to address both the EU uh, decisions and policies and the American and US policies? What are the four simple things that will keep competitive markets, even if you may have a dominant player, that dominant player can quickly be replaced. For example, Dennis used to work for BlackBerry. And because we have interoperability of devices, this device can go on AT&T, it can go on Verizon, it can operate on Sprint, it can operate on T-Mobile. That's interoperability. And because of that, you have a competitive market so that even though that one day you may have be a BlackBerry and the next day it may be iPhone and the next day it may be Android, you can enter the market and compete and disrupt it. Now, interoperability took a rule by the FCC, multiple decisions by the FCC, and it wasn't through antitrust after the fact correction, it was a preventive step that creates free markets. What is another example of that? Interconnection policy in the open internet makes sure that edge providers can compete with content, whether it's a Netflix or a Comcast, to get to the end user. And so you have content competition that you may have streamers, dreamers, and startups, and Ubers and Lyfts or whatever may come because the network enables that, and there's no gatekeeper that can block that. Now, that is a preventive, pro-competitive policy that keeps free markets functioning. If you allow a gatekeeper to block that type of new content, new competition, then you have to have antitrust action that is much harder and much more costly. What is another uh, example of, of, of good policy that prevents market failure? So you have interconnection interoperability, and then market structure. So when, when you block Comcast from merging and you keep at least four to a market with, you know, with open networks, interconnection, interoperability, those simple things keep markets functioning in digital platforms. Market structure, interoperability, interconnection, open internet, open networks. And if, if whether it's Europe, or America, you do those simple things, you do not have to have antitrust issues. You have good policy that, that prevents market failure. And uh, uh, any, any questions in the audience? Do we have, I, I, one last question for Chip. What did you think when Facebook acknowledged that it was 
per, you know, uh, demoting conservative news in its algorithm. Um, do, do you think that that, and, 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 uh, and, and also the, you know, to a lesser extent, uh, but also of interest, this, this Google problem, when, when uh, you, you, do you think it's okay to just go to the company and say, look, you know, we, we hope that you change your mind about how you're doing this? Um, or, and leave it up to them, or is is that a sign that uh, Look, if, if something if you needs have to be a, done? If you have open platforms, open internet, which we just adopted as the FCC affirmed by the court, I can choose Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter. I can go to any content, get any source that I want to. I, you know, I can watch Fox. I can watch CNBC. It depends. On, you know, you can go anywhere to get any content because we have openness. Um, so I really don't care. Um, you know, what their algorithm is. Their algorithm is part of my choice. I can watch whatever and get whatever content, social or traditional, that I want. All right, well, th thank you so much to all of our panelists. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs>